Easter came early this year, and it surprised me. At First Church, our life together revolves around the liturgical year with its seasons that allows us to move with a rhythm, a rhythm that flows year after year. I have always found this flow to be comforting rather than challenging, but this year was markedly different. While there are a few set dates, like Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, the beginnings and endings of the other seasons are not on the same day year after year, which can be very confusing. And while I do not know who is in charge in the major scheme of things of setting the calendar for the liturgical year, I'm thinking that I would like to arrange a meet with whoever that is so that I could share my thoughts about some much needed improvements. <laughs> Granted, I was happy that the season of Advent in the new liturgical year started a week later, which meant the first Sunday of Advent was not on Thanksgiving weekend. In the church world, that is a major win. But it did mean that the fourth Sunday of Advent and Christmas Eve were on the same day. And I feel certain that mistake is what led to this rainy, cold Easter day in LA. <laughs> now, just to say, I finished this sermon at 12.45 a.m. this morning, and the sun had not yet come out. In fact, it was pouring rain on Canyon Drive at my house which goes to show the divine always has the last word. Although on the brighter side, due to this rather odd liturgical year, this year's season of Lent began with Ash Wednesday on Valentine's Day. And we are celebrating Easter on Trans Visibility Day, which makes perfect sense since our Lenten series revolved around the theme of reconnecting with love. So we find ourselves on what was forecast to be a rainy, cloudy, cold morning in L.A., gathered together with the sun shining to celebrate a mysterious story that began over 2,000 years ago. Because we are an extremely diverse congregation on so many levels, we come to this story with very different understandings and expectations. Lent this year was a wonderfully expansive season. Over the last 40 days, Lent has helped us to open our hearts, our minds, and our bodies to the depths of God's love for each one of us. Within the weeks of Lent and this comforting message, we were also challenged to think about how our response to this love might happen and to consider how we might share what we have found with a world so desperately in need of God's love and our love. We often forget in the midst of our lives that the world has always been desperately in need of love. And while the stories of the life of Jesus can seem so far removed from our reality, 2,000 years ago, the world was in a mess, not unlike our own today. The land that Jesus walked on is once again caught in the throes of power and war unbearable suffering and death, just as it was then. In the midst of the mess 2,000 years ago, the message of audacious love that Jesus brought was as radical then as it is right now. And sadly, now as then, it is hard to imagine what the future will bring for all those who suffer. That is why I am very partial to the story Lance and Brittany read today. 
John's gospel is my favorite. And while it does not shy away from the unbearable suffering, it does help us imagine the possibility of a new future story. After the crucifixion of Jesus and after the observance of the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb where Jesus had been placed after his death. When she arrived, Mary found the stone that had sealed the tomb as Passover began had been removed and the body of Jesus was gone. This reality was confirmed by two other disciples and then Mary was left in her sorrow alone until she saw someone she mistook for a gardener and everything changed. Jan Richardson writes, Mary's weeping gave way to seeing, to recognition, to the astounding joy of what we call resurrection. In the midst of her grief that morning, Mary's dreams of a way forward were brought to life again. That day, John's Gospel tells us, Mary learned that death does not have the final word and that love can always be found in the midst of pain and suffering. Granted, in order to see the miracles, we must open our hearts and reconnect with that which is always waiting for us to recognize its existence. It is true the Easter story does require imagination. It does require us to bring down our wall of suspicion and open our hearts to the power of love that resides deep within all of us. The Apostle Paul asserted in many of his letters of love he wrote for the early church that the celebration of Easter is an affirmation that in addition to love, there is also a power at work. It is a power within us that is able to accomplish exceedingly more than we can imagine. Thank goodness that power is there because we need some help with imagining the new story, the future story that brings everything together once again. Many of us have gotten into the habit of picking up the Easter story year after year, dusting it off, reading it, and saying and singing the familiar, and of course here, now the unfamiliar words, and then without a moment's hesitation, putting it all right back on the shelf and never thinking about it until this time next year. But these days, we do so at our own peril because this story is not a once a year story. This is a story that we need to live each and every day. There is no doubt within this story, there lies a power at work, a power that can bring life out of death, hope out of suffering, and communion out of profound alienation. This is a story that makes the impossible possible. So what then is the power within this story, the power Paul referred to? Could it perhaps simply be the spirit of life, that spirit that flows in and through and between all of who we are and who we might become? Could this power be the spirit which becomes the hidden order within the chaos, the life within death, the love and sense of belonging that is more fundamental than the violence and alienation that carries the news these days? The first disciples, in writing their news reports, claimed that Jesus was raised from the grave. And while some of us may not take the stories of Easter literally, Neither should we dismiss their claims as an idle tale. They are far too powerful for that. 
woven within the New Testament writings that followed the initial reports, we find powerful stories about how people's lives changed when they experienced the love and presence of the risen Christ. The story from the Gospel of John paints a beautiful picture of the essential truth that happens between Mary and Jesus at the tomb. Jen Richardson reminds us of how the sound of her name caused Mary to begin weeping. And the sound of her name caused that weeping to give way to seeing, to recognition, to the astounding joy of resurrection. And as much as we want to just linger in that place, on this Easter Sunday morning. The story doesn't end there for Mary or for us because it is a story that calls all of us beyond ourselves. In answering the call of Jesus to go and live out that story, miraculously, Mary finds the life that comes from death. And because of her willingness to let go of the old life, to step into her new life and to tell what she has seen, Mary becomes the first preacher of the good news. Tradition has not told us very much about the rest of her story, but whatever may have become of Mary Magdalene beyond Easter morning, John's gospel clearly tells us that it was to her that the risen Christ first revealed themselves and that she was the one he called to carry that news that everything had changed. She was the one who reminded all who followed not only of the life and death of Jesus, but also the life from death of Jesus the Christ. Might the telling of Jesus' death and resurrection through the example of Mary Magdalene also become a pattern for us? Many of us need to die to old narratives, beliefs, and assumptions that keep us down, that keep us imprisoned, and our real lives hidden. We need to fully grasp the story that reminds us we have been created in the image of God, an image that is very good, and that we are loved beyond measure by the God who always and forever is on our side and with us. I wonder on this Easter morning what it would be like to leave all of that that holds us so tightly behind. I wonder what it would be like for us to be raised up into people who have the ability to change not only ourselves, but our world. Could we become people who are motivated not by fear and mere survival, but instead people who by the prospect of being agents of the sacred become capable of being a new source of new life and a presence of love in a world that so desperately needs that new life and that sustaining love. On this morning, with one heart and one mind, we step into the mystery of this day. And I believe with all my heart that we will be changed as together we dream the way forward. May it be so. May it be so for all of us. Hallelujah. Amen.